Well, good morning, Ebenezer. And praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? I don't know about you, but as we kick off this month of February, as we celebrate our history, whom the sun sets free, is truly free indeed. Anybody got a victory shout in your spirit this morning? That when you look back over your life, that when you look down through the years, that when you look back through generations past and generations present, you have a praise on your lips that if it had not been for the Lord that was on our side, where would we be? Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Come on and give God a shout of praise this morning, church. We're ready to lift up his holy and righteous name. So I hope that these songs that you begin to listen to this morning will start to free your mind and your spirit and just take you into a place of victory, a place of rejoicing, a place where you feel like you can just give a war cry shout unto your father. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm free indeed, in Christ I'm free indeed, no chains are holding me, it's who I choose to be. See, I'm free indeed, in Christ I'm free indeed, no chains are holding me, it's who I choose to be. Say, I'm free indeed, I'm free indeed, in Christ. No chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. Everybody, I'm free in this said In Christ, in Christ, I'm free. No chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. Say it again. Come on, y'all. I'm free in this said In Christ, in Christ, I'm free. No chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. Open up your mouth and say, I'm free. Yeah. In Christ. In Christ, I'm free. No chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. I choose to be free. That's my decision. I choose. Chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. Say I'm free indeed. In Christ. Listen, I'ma change the words. Who was blind, but now I see. It's who I'm meant to be. I'm free indeed. In Christ. Who was blind, but now I see. I'm so glad that I know. I'm meant to be I'm free come on and declare it church was blind but now I see it's who I'm meant to be I choose to be free
Cause I'm free indeed In Christ I'm free indeed No chains are holding me That's who I choose to be Oh, I'm free indeed In Christ I'm free indeed No chains are holding me It's who I choose to be Everybody say I'm free, I'm free indeed. Come on, in Christ, in Christ let me hear you with your voice this morning. It's who I choose to be. One voice, one sound. Everybody say, in Christ. No chains are holding me. It's who I choose to be. One more time, I'm free indeed. In Christ. Was blind, but now I see. It's who I'm meant to be. I'm free indeed in Christ. Was blind, but now I see. It's who I'm meant to be. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. I'm free. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue to give God the praise He deserves. Come on, let's move a little bit in the spirit. Come on, do I have any dancers like David? How many of you will give God more than anything? Anybody grateful? Anybody thankful? The song is real simple. It goes like this. Say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Everybody say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. More than anything. Come on, church, and say it with me. Say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. I place no one above you. Place no one above you. Say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love more you. than anything. More than anything. I can't hear you, church. Can you repeat after me? Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, 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 Lord. Say, Lord, here we go, church, repeat after me. Say, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I praise you. I lift my hands and raise you. Come on, church. Say, Lord, I praise you more than anything. Anything. More than anything. He's been so good to 
to me. Uh, he's been so good to me. Oh, 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 more than anything. More than anything. Father to the fatherless, uh, mother to the motherless. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, y'all. Say, I love you. I love Say, you. I love you. I love you. More than anything, I need you. 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 Say more than anything. I love you. Anybody love him? Anybody love him? Oh, say more than anything. I need you. Say more than anything. 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 Come on and worship the Lord. Hey! Come on and worship. Put those hands together. Church, listen to this. Oh, 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 everybody, can y'all give me an O? Oh, 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 come on, confuse the enemy with your O.
power in that name. I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but Jesus, call on the name of Jesus. Woke me up this morning, started me on my way. He's the giver of life, hope, and grace. Jesus, 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 Say Jesus, 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 power in that name. Jesus, 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 Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus. Everybody, Jesus, Jesus. Come on and call on the name above our name. Anybody need a healer? He's a way maker, a mind regulator. and give God the praise he deserves. Come on, no other name like his name. I searched all over and still couldn't find nobody. I looked high and then I looked low and still couldn't find nobody. I looked to my mother and my father, my sister and my brother, and I still couldn't find nobody. I went to Google and to all of the internet and I still couldn't find nobody. I went to my friend and I went to my pastor and I still couldn't find nobody greater. Nobody stronger, nobody wiser, nobody better. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, call that name. Jesus, Jesus. Nobody, 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 nobody. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, 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 Jesus, Jesus. I can run to Him in prayer, oh Jesus. Every time I go, Jesus, Jesus. oh Jesus, 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 Woo! Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hope there's somebody who came to be glad today. I don't know what God brought you through and brought you out of, but you are in his house right now. And we're here for one reason and one reason only. That is to give God praise, honor, and thanks. Put your hands together. If it was a Saturday afternoon in the fall and Georgia, the Bulldogs scored a touchdown, you wouldn't be able to hold yourself. So, But Georgia Bulldogs can't do nothing for you. They can't pay your bills. But I tell you one thing, God will open doors for you. And if you know that God is good, you ought to let somebody know that God is good. Let us pray, eternal and everlasting God, we thank you. God, we thank you because you're so good. God, you've done for us what we could not do for ourselves, and so we have entered into this place. We've come to your house, oh God, that we might let our hair down, that we might put our bags and our troubles down, that we might focus on you. Here we are, oh God, we're inquiring in your temple. We're beholding your beauty, oh God. Now give us the strength that we need to say a prayerful word, oh God, to, to sing a joyful song today, oh God. We want to make a joyful noise in the house today. God, allow the Holy Spirit to move freely in this place. Let the Holy Spirit tear down some walls that we put up. Let the Holy Spirit move something that we think is unmovable. Let the Holy Spirit heal something we think is unhealable. God, we know you can. We are here. Now use us. Use us, oh God, to thy will and thy purpose. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And for his sake. 
Amen, amen, and amen. Won't you put your hands together one more time and give God some praise on this day. Please remain standing as on this first Sunday of Black History Month, we sing the Negro National Anthem. First verse. Just the first verse. Lift every voice and sing. Feel of the heaven ring. Drink with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. How let the listening skies let it resound. remain standing as we recite uh, the mission statement here at the Ebenezer Baptist Church West. Won't you recite it with me? The mission of the Ebenezer Baptist Church West is to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that it transforms non-believers into believers, believers into disciples, and disciples into fruitful mature leaders who will in turn go back into the world to reach others for Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I remain standing as you seek uh, to welcome you into this place, into God's house. Uh, and it's not a strange place because this is your father's house. Uh, everybody ought to visit daddy every once in a while. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so to all of those who are visiting with us for the very first time, uh, we just want to say welcome, wherever you may be. Uh, we invite you to please stand where you are. Those who might be streaming, uh, we ask if you're visiting with us uh, uh, virtually for the first time, drop something in the chat for us. Let us know that you're here for the first time uh, so that we might reach out to you and give you a virtual hug right back. We are so eternally thankful that God never forgets us. God never misses a moment to show us how much God loves us. And so your presence here today as an angel in our midst, we just want you to know how grateful we are that God ordered your footsteps this way. Let me also tag this to let you know that if you are indeed searching for a church home, if you're looking for a place that you can call home on Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Saturday morning, we invite you to prayerfully consider the Ebenezer Baptist Church West. We would love to have you as a member of this part of God's vineyard. Uh, we have a song we like to sing whenever we are entertaining angels. Welcome into this place. Won't you greet your neighbor on your left and your right? Make them feel welcome. Y'all are looking so good out there. We hope that if you've not found a church home, as Pastor said, you've arrived right at the right place. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Welcome, welcome to this place of worship. Won't you join us? Welcome. This is. Oh, if you're looking for a home. In the name of the Lord, you are, you are, you are welcome, yes you are, oh, yes you are welcome, hey, come on everybody, welcome, Woo. come on and welcome, won't you join? Oh, if you're looking for a home, then you've arrived. 
the name
never forget never shall forget what he's done for me. It's, watch this, it's, it's good to remember what God did for other people, but you ought never forget what God has done for you. Your testimony does not belong to you so whatever God has brought you through, whatever God has put behind you, whatever God has delivered you from, it ought to be a part of your repertoire of praise to God. I never shall forget what he's done for me. Amen. Somebody, somebody put your hands together. Why? Amen. I never shall forget. Thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a few, a few announcements. Um, uh, uh, we're going to get it kicked off right here with a party. You know, we're going to get it kicked off with a party because it is February. And it may be the shortest month out of the year. But it's the best month out of the year. I tell you that. It's the best. So if you were born during the month of February, please stand up. All February babies, please stand up. Amen. Amen. Look at that. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't sit down. Don't sit down. This is your month. This is your month. So, so we're going to make up a song right quick. Can we make up a quick one? one? Let's two, just make it happen. One, two, and happy birthday. shortest version I'm not gonna we didn't cheat y'all we didn't cheat you happy happy birthday to all of you born uh, in what 28 days 28 days right <laughs> y'all don't even get 29 this year that ain't right we're gonna do something we're gonna fight we're gonna fight y'all need 29 days everybody else got 30 and 31 but for February since it is February we recognize it as the best month of the year Till March. <laughs> Till March. Yeah, 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 March. March is coming. It's coming. And, uh, if the, uh, as my grandmother would say, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. So, But happy birthday to all of our February babies. Uh, many of you, many of you notice uh, that there's a little something different in the sanctuary today across this back wall up here. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Um, what you may have missed is that even here, our paraments on the 
pulpit and also on the communion table uh, are all of African print, African print. We wanted to make sure that when we celebrate, we celebrate in total, that we remind ourselves, that we look like us while we are doing it. Ah. Ubuntu is a, uh, a Bantu word that means humanness, humanity. And many of us know it because we, it, it comes with the accompanying principle of I am because we are. And we are because I am. And I like to make the short leap right over to Exodus uh, where God, when, when, when Moses says, whom shall I say sent me? And, and then this voice comes out of yonder that says, I am that I am. And so when we think about, this brother going to interrupt me while I'm in there. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Where was I again? I am. I, mean, just, I didn't write this down. Y'all got to help me out. Y'all got. I am who I am, which ties us so intricately and intimately to the Father. Homer, the writer of the Iliad and the Odyssey, great philosophers like Philo, all wrote about and talked about the place where God lived. And they talk about at separate times in different places where the Garden of Eden is. And according to them, and I'm just giving, using them as a reference point because they didn't look like us. We don't think. Ah. But they wrote about where Eden was, the place where God lived, and it was just south of Ethiopia. Ethiopia was not this small territory that is now in our post-colonial world a little small nation but Egypt and Ethiopia swept across northern part of Africa the Horn of Africa into what we know of as the Middle East hence the Tigris and the Euphrates that are geographically in the Middle East belong to Africa just like the Nile come with me I am because we are and we are because I am ties us intricately to God the Father. We are unashamedly black. Don't you ever let nobody tell you, make you feel inferior. Watch this and I'm going to move on over. Unashamedly black. Why? Because God didn't make us better than anybody else but he also didn't make us worse than anybody else. Unashamedly black, unapologetically Christian. We don't, we don't apologize because when he died, he died for you and for you and for you. It wasn't just Europeans that we painted people over in the Bible with. Just to let you know, the Bible was written on three continents. Africa, Asia, and Europe does not show up until way down into the New Testament times. Africa, Asia, and Europe. And Europe didn't even look like Europe looks like now. Brown folk, unapologetically Christian, and Ashe simply means so be it. The Hebrew translates, so be it, as amen, ashe. I am because we are, we are because I am. I am unashamedly black. I am unapologetically Christian. I am, amen. God bless you, God bless you. This, we didn't order this, by the way. We didn't order it. God sent it. All of these pyramids, these banners, God sent. Through connections, I was able to touch base with an angel. An angel who I could tell, this is what we're looking for. And I think we had about three months to get it together. 
and I just want to introduce you guys. I invited her to come to worship with us today. Sister Henrietta Brown, would you please stand? She put all of it. Stand, stand. We want to see you. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. The seamstress. We are so th And guess what? This ain't all. She made a whole bunch for us, so we are eternally grateful. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, you didn't have to do it, but I invited her and she came. God bless you. Thank you so much. And today's, I've talked to her for three months, the first time I've ever seen her face to face. But God is good. God is good. Thank you so much. Uh, you have blessed us immeasurably um, uh, with this. Uh, as we press forward, uh, and, I, and, and I'm a little distracted because I, we got another, another, another usher in the back over there. And this brother, he's tall, he's good look. I, was, I was looked back and I was like, when did Denzel become a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church? And this brother, Kevin Payne, God bless you, Doc. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, sir. He ain't wearing that purple and gold by accident either. Yeah, he got on the dashiki, but he, he was intentional about that purple and gold. Amen, somebody. Um, the 2024 Howard B. Stroud Community Health Symposium and Lunch will be uh, next Saturday, uh, February 10th. Uh, it begins, registration begins at 9 a.m. You can, uh, uh, well, you can't RSVP now because that was yesterday. So you can still go those. It's a wonderful program. Uh, it is held annually. And uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll really enjoy yourself if you go by. Again, it's next Saturday. Registration begins at 9 a.m. Uh, for all of those, uh, the, the Sequoia Marriage Ministry, those who will be going with us, uh, leaving on Thursday, going to Punta Cana uh, for a three-day marriage retreat, I need to see you directly after service right over here. Got a little information for you uh, as we prepare to leave on Thursday morning. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, we have a lecture series coming up uh, during the month of Black History on, uh, and I want you to put this in your calendar, put it in your calendar, uh, on February 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, February 20th, 21st, and 22nd, we have three brilliant scholars. Uh, they all happen to be professors at the University of Georgia. Uh, uh, and uh, on Tuesday, February 20th, we have Dr. Robert Pratt, our own Dr. Robert Pratt, the first uh, black tenured professor uh, in the history department at UGA, and he's still teaching. Um, but he is going to lecture on lesser known figures of the civil rights movement. Lesser known figures of the civil rights movement. On Wednesday, February 21st, uh, we will have Dr. Stephen Berry, uh, who, will, who is an expert, the South's uh, foremost authority on the civil, uh, on the civil war. And, and beyond, he will be here to lecture on the original Black Panther, Prince Rivers. If you don't, everybody know where Augusta is? Everybody know Augusta is? There's, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just want to make sure you pay attention. Um, right on the banks of the Savannah River, there was a little black town post-Civil War. The mayor was a man named Prince Rivers, a brother who was brilliant. He was also the justice of the peace. And on 4th of July one year, a band of our European brethren decided that they wanted to ride their horses right down the middle of the street during their 4th of July celebration. And they forbade them. They turned and went away and they came back. And you know the rest of the story. That area where Brother Pickens was the mayor is now the most exclusive neighborhood in Augusta, Georgia today. That same neighborhood, that same neighborhood. Um, so he will be here to lecture for us on Wednesday, February 21st. Uh, and then on Thursday, we will have Dr. Sandy Martin, who is my advisor, my PhD advisor. Dr. Martin will be here to uh, lecture on the black church in black history the black church and black history. Each night, the lectures will begin at 6.30. Uh, we'll have 45 minutes of them lecturing and we'll have 45 minutes to question them, to ask them, to challenge them, uh, to learn from them. So I'm excited about that. Um, uh, there will be that February 20th, 21st, and 22nd. 
please mark your calendars. Let's come out and learn. Bring somebody with you. They don't have to be. This is not limited to Ebenezer Baptist Church West. We want the community to hear about black history. Uh, and then we're going to send a copy of it down to DeSantis down in Florida just so he'll know that clearly he's inept. Um, on third Sunday, when our youth will be singing, Brother Benny Roberson will be here. He's going to bring a lot of artifacts, some artifacts, some things that, uh, uh, that many of you grew up with just knowing secondhand. He's going to bring some of those things, things like a washboard, uh, got an old foot tub, not the new ones that you get, they ain't, they ain't, they ain't real, that ain't foot tub, and foot tub, soak your feet, and some Epsom salt, that's hot water. Um, he's going to bring a lot of artifacts. Uh, they're going to be in the fellowship hall, uh, and we want everybody to leave here and go directly over to the fellowship hall, and we're going to follow our children. We're going to let them go first so that they can see something. He, he told me he's also got one of those, one of those old irons. It kind of didn't have no plug. You got to heat it up so you can iron. That's put it in the fire. So we, we need our children to know about these kinds of things. That's the third Sunday. Uh, and the artifacts in the lobby right over here. Um, uh, were, uh, were brought in the courtesy of the Bloodsaw family and Sister Alfreda Rogers. Uh, and the note right here is all in caps. Look, but don't touch. It's shown up, don't take. Amen, somebody. It don't take. Don't take. Don't. Uh, Y'all look good. Y'all look good in your African attire. If you don't have your African attire, my brothers and sisters, go get some. Go get some. Um, uh, uh, and, and I will tell you, there are several people here who have a longstanding relationship with Sister Bertha Rambo. Anybody know Sister Bertha? It was everybody here. Sister Bertha Rambo, she doesn't live very far from the church. She has uh, the store that she used to have. She has all that stuff in her house. Uh, and so you can reach out to her. Uh, the office has her telephone number if you need the number. So you can set up an appointment to go by. Please go by and support her as she dresses you up, dresses you up like so many of y'all. Y'all look good. You look, look like a bacon and egg sandwich just with hot sauce on it. I don't, I don't even eat a lot of hot sauce, but y'all look good. Amen, amen, amen. My final announcement is this. Um, uh, to all of the brothers who were able to come on Friday night, we know everybody was not, but the real talk brother to brother on Friday night was monumental. Uh, there was a spirit in that place from seven o'clock until midnight. We had to stop. There wasn't a person making their way to the door because the spirit of the Lord was upon us. What a powerful, powerful move of the spirit on Friday. To all of you who were there, God bless you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of what God is doing here in the lives of black men at the Ebenezer Baptist Church West. Amen. I see a few members of the kitchen staff. Thank you all for feeding us. We came up in there hungry, not hungry. We came in there hungry. We had fried fish and chicken and all kind of good stuff. And it was just, just delicious. We were able to really open up and share brother to brother in a world that shows us and teaches us that we are not our brother's keeper we are our brother's enemy amen 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 and i see a flyer being held up right here in the middle black male voter registration drive if i'm not going to tell you to raise your hand if you ain't registered to vote but i want you to pay attention because um uh there are far too many brothers who have decided that voting doesn't matter. This, this is what the, the statistics tell us. And when we see voter turnout by election precinct, by district, it bears itself out. Certainly there are too many of us have to, who have to check the box and we don't think we can go vote. And I'm not, in, in Georgia, can you, can you vote? You have to check the box. In Georgia? Not sure. We're going to figure that out. But that is a barrier for some, but there are far too many of us who simply just don't go vote. 
We have to make our voice heard. We have to make our voice heard. Thank you so much. And uh, and, and, and and if you need more information, would you please stand up? Uh, Chaplain Cole, Chaplain Cole can give you all the information you need, brothers, to help register you. Amen. Amen. Um, and I'm not sure. They told me we're not going to do the video. Give me thumbs up if yes. Oh, we can. All right. So this brother, he just he just wanted time on the stage, and then he just walked up here. That was it. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, all right, all right. So we have a um, each Sunday we're going to have a Black History moment that's going to be presented, and today um, uh, we have one from our young people. So if you don't mind. Hi, my name is Elise. Today I will be talking to you about Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was born in 1924 in Brooklyn, New York, but spent several years living with her grandmother in the Caribbean. In college, she became involved in politics and student organizations, where she could share her strong opinions, which made people stop and listen. Shirley worked as a teacher and made a name for herself by being involved with many organizations around her community, including the local NAACP. She was also active in many political organizations. In 1964, she earned a seat in the New York State Assembly, and in 1968, she became the first black woman elected to Congress. She was an independent thinker and was never one to stay in her own lane. In 1972, she announced her run for president. She ultimately lost, but she did achieve her goal of making her party more aware of and responsive for the people. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, sister, young sister Elise and mom and dad are back there all the way. Wave your hand so we can see. See, they, they, they did all the hard work. They did all the hard work, amen. We get to enjoy the fruit. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, what a great, what a great and legendary figure for all of us. Uh, I'm going to step aside as the choir sings, but I do want you to know uh, that Shirley Chisholm made one of the great statements. She made many, but the one that always sticks close to my heart. Uh, as people were challenging her about meeting with so many different people across the aisle and everything, and uh, uh, Shirley Chisholm said, "If you don't have a seat at the table, you might be what's for dinner." That's why you got to have a really good minister of music. He was like, Doc, Doc, we didn't take up the offering. I know that's right. Amen. 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 Ah, ah, ah. It is that time, offering time. Amen. Ah, amen. When you think about how far God, not just how far God has brought us, but from where God brought us to where we are now, both as a community and as individuals, it's easy to see how we ought to be thankful. And being thankful is not just what we say. We say a lot. Being thankful is better seen in what we do. God's word reminds us to bring ye the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Which suggests that your tithe is an important part of what God is doing in this world. Do not underestimate what God can do through you. God could have made you just like everybody else, but God made you unique because there's something unique for you to bring to God's house. The Bible teaches us that we should all bring back one-tenth. We bring back the tithe. We give the offering. They are not the same. The tithe is an edict. It's a command. It's an order from God. The offering is is above and beyond because some of us know just how much God has done for us. If you have your offering with you, 
I invite you to hold it up if it's your phone and you give electronically and you've never done it here before, you can put your phone up, open your camera to the QR code. Click and it will take you right to the site so that you might be able to give. If you've already written your check, if you have it rolled up in your hand, please hold it up that we might pray over it. Almighty and merciful God, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for many thousands of blessings bestowed upon us, O oh God, that we have not deserved. But you, O oh God, is our good God. And so we ask right now that you would bless this offering. It may not be all, O oh God, we can give to express our thanks, but we bring back what you have commanded to us. God, those of us who have not yet grown into that space of giving a full 10%, we ask that you will continue to place it upon their hearts. That as we give to you, you always give it back to us. Now bless this offering to thy will and thy purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen, amen, and amen. You may drop your offering off. Uh, in any of the receptacles in the back or here on the side. Please remember the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen.
because that is who he is. Come on, church, let us know that you know that he's a way maker. He's my miracle worker. When I thought I was going to die, God stepped in and he changed things. He healed my body one day. And he gave me a vision just to keep on moving, just to keep pressing, because I know that he can change things. I don't care what it looks like. God can make a way out of no way. I want y'all to raise that. I know he's a, he's a way. talk a lot about the difference between knowing the words and knowing the song. Anybody know there's a difference between those two? You can sing the words because you can memorize you can sing the words because mama may have taught them to you. You can sing the words because you might be caught up in the emotion. But when you sing the song, it's because you know what God can do in the circumstances of life. That's why when we were growing up, I know, I know, everybody remember when Saturday used to be the day you cleaned the house up? You remember that? Remember that? Cleaning the house on Saturday and the TV can't be on. All we wanted to do was watch Soul Train, but we got, the TV can't be on. You gotta, you, you, it's clean up time. It's time to clean up. But watch this, watch this. Every once in a while, if your house was like mine, every once in a while, a song would, 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 would break out. And it was a hymn of the church that would break out and, and now everybody in the house is saying ain't no music nowhere but the song is in the house and when you finish singing the house is clean and you feel better. Maybe that's why the family's so messed up now. A lot of folk don't clean up on Saturdays. Folk don't. Don't spend that time not to be close to God, but to let God get close to you. Uh, those who have your Bibles, uh, if you don't mind, 
for the unintentionally on my behalf for the third Sunday in a row, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, book of Jonah chapter 4, the book of Jonah chapter 4, uh, beginning at that fifth verse, and I just want to say as well, uh, as we, uh, as you, when you find it, signify by standing to your feet, but I just want to say uh, I, my heart is full that my niece Cammie, oh, there she is, Dude, wave your hand so they can see you, that's my niece right there, that's my, that's my first niece, that's my first niece. Love you, girl, like I love collard. I tell you, that's my <laughs> collard grain. Yeah, but with a dash of vinegar. I, I mean, real collards. Eh? Not them with the sugar in That ain't collards. That ain't collards. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, Book of Jonah, chapter 4, beginning at the fifth verse, where it reads, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Uh, there he made, a, he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun rose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and their left and much livestock. Thus seemeth the reading of God's holy word for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. Hmm. Verse 9 says, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about a plant? Hmm. Uh, I want to tag this text this morning, Jonah's dilemma. Jonah's dilemma. I would that you, as we get started, turn to your neighbor and say, the road to redemption is paved with forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, they, they, tell, tell somebody else, they didn't. The road to redemption is paved with forgiveness. Now watch this, they did not hear it because of them, if they didn't. They didn't hear it because there's a lack of forgiveness in you that would not let you speak in a way that they understood. Uh-oh. Jonah's dilemma. It's Black History Month, and I sure hope that February ends better than January ended for me. See, because January 31st was Wednesday, and uh, didn't get off to a good start from the very beginning. Uh, I, took, I had to take Imani to school early because she had a test in history. Uh, and as we pulled out of the garage, I asked her, so what matter does this test that I'm taking you to school early for, what does it cover? She said, post-reconstruction. 
Now my antenna went up because that's the period that most of my research and interest lives in. It's that period, that very period, that I believe is critical even when we look at the black community today. See, post-Reconstruction is that period after Reconstruction, uh, and it began with the Great Compromise of 1877. Now, that compromise did two things. It gave Rutherford B. Hayes the presidency after a contested election, and this, by the same token, he had to agree to remove the troops from the South in order to main, or, and, and they had been put there at the close of the Civil War uh, because it was there or the troops were here to maintain order where the majority of Africans in this nation had been liberated. So I asked Imani, what she had been taught about Reconstruction. And on cue, she said that Reconstruction failed due to mismanagement and waste. Uh, how did I know that would be her answer? Because that was what I was taught in school and it's likely what you were taught in school. So on the 12 minute drive to school, I shared with her that last year I wrote a paper on reconstruction and the very first line of the very first paragraph read reconstruction was an overwhelming success. Uh, for those, make sure that you start your paper out with a good thesis sentence. Uh, so what's the difference between what I was writing and what she's being taught. The difference is truth versus epic. Uh, you see, epic narratives, uh, epic history, U.S. history is epic history because it teaches to the victor belong the spoils. The victor records history. Epic history is more concerned with the poetic praising of the past than with an accurate reporting of the past. More important that you feel good about yourself. Hence, folk talk, we, nobody should be made to feel bad sitting in class. If they don't know, they ought to. That's the way they feel better. Epic history, that's why most of you here today, maybe not the ones upstairs, but those of you who are here today know who made this statement. I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. George Washington. We know that, but there's no historical evidence that it ever happened. It's called legend. Yet generation after generation, we teach our kids this garbage. You can delete that from your memory banks to create space for real history. Real history, like the fact that Washington's, uh, in his will, he followed the lead of one of his close fellow founding father friends, Robert Carter III who liberated over 500 enslaved Africans in one fell swoop. To this very day, it still stands historically as the single largest manumission of enslaved Africans by an individual. Robert Carter III, you didn't learn that. That's all right. That's why you got a pastor who did. The difference between Carter and Washington, though, is that Carter's liberation of those who were held in bondage happened during his lifetime. Washington liberated his enslaved upon his death, which in truth was a selfish act. Because by the time he had written his will, it wasn't just Phyllis Wheatley who could read in the dark. 
there were others. And they knew that as soon as he died, the only thing that stood between them and 246 years of chattel slavery was Martha. So what did Martha do? <laughs> Martha freed them all because she knew that she wouldn't be around long if she didn't. And notice that I did not call our ancestors slaves. Hmm. Calling African slaves, first of all, says that that's what God created them to be. But it casts Europeans as masters. Yet calling them the enslaved renders their captors enslavers. It's not nearly as cute and cuddly as master. It rests from them the notion and the title of savior. As y'all can tell, I didn't come to mess around today. We came to teach and preach. Uh, God did not make slaves. God made children. Greed made slaves of God's chosen people. So I told Imani, despite what you need to tell her on this test today, after all it was a test, don't try to don't tell her what I told you today. You call, you have a meeting after school. <laughs> Taxes are high. <laughs> I told her, despite what you need to answer on the test today. Reconstruction was not a failure. Reconstruction saw an explosion, the proliferation of black churches. Reconstruction saw the proliferation of black businesses like butcher shops and barber shops and, and salons and beauty parlors and funeral parlors and banks and insurance companies. In fact, the majority of HBCUs were created during Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't believe me. 1865, Bowie State, Clark College, Atlanta University, Shaw University, and Virginia Union University, 1866. Edwaters College, Fisk University, Lincoln University, Rust College, 1867. Alabama State, Barbara Scotia College, Fayetteville State, Howard University, Johnson C. Smith, Morehouse College, Morgan State, St. Augustine's, and Talladega College, 1868, Hampton University, 1869, Claflin University, Dillard University, Tougaloo College, and Simmons College, 1870, Allen University and Benedict College, 1871, Alcorn State, 1872, Paul Quinn College, 1873, Bennett College, University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, and Wiley University, 1875, Knoxville College, Alabama A&M, Houston Tillotson University, 1876, Prayer Review A&M, Harry Medical College, and Stillman College. College, 1877, Jackson State University and Philander Smith University. Don't you let anybody tell you that that reconstruction was a failure because half the folk in here have been impacted by the fruit. And because Lincoln's reconstruction was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. It challenged southern white notions of white superiority. It cast black achievement and black success against the winds of white privilege and it frightened them to the core. It destabilized their worldview. It made them think that God made them special above others. Because when your identity is based upon the false pretense 
of superiority uh, over black inferiority. You are conditioned to believe being black is a curse. You're conditioned, my brothers and sisters, to being to seeing black meaning that God does not love you, that being black means that you're less than, but then when you see God bless blackness, when you see God making ways for black folk, when you see God blessing black people and it throws off your whole worldview, you're in chaos. That's why brilliant sister Kay K. Wright Lewis wrote a book, A Curse Upon a Nation. She uncovers the notion that achievement in blacks during Reconstruction moved them from something to be controlled to something that had to be exterminated. That's what gave birth, rebirth to the KKK. That's what gave breath to Jim and Jane Crow. That's what annulled the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, removing freedom, removing the vote, removing belongingness. Reconstruction undermined and destroyed the notion of black inferiority. That's why Reconstruction had to be dismantled. That's why Reconstruction is mistaught today. It preserves false narratives, not only of black inferiority, but it preserves false notions of white superiority. 750,000 people died for black freedom because of black freedom and I contend that the number is plus one. It's 750,000 plus one because Abraham Lincoln died not because he loved black people but because he knew slavery was wrong and he had the guts to do something about it. He had the guts to stand up. He had the guts to put the nation on the line because Reconstruction did everything it was supposed to do. It was a rousing success. But watch this. The impediments to black success are not just over there. They're also in here. Reverend Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood, legendary pastor all over the country. And he'll be our men's day speaker this year. But Dr. Youngblood preached a sermon that I happened to be in the audience for back in the early 2000s where he uttered a thought that mirrored the same sentiment Mohandas Gandhi uttered about his own people under British occupation and colonization. Dr. Youngblood said, I'm afraid that if white America, if the heart of white America would change tomorrow, black folk wouldn't be ready. That's a long ways to go, my brothers and sisters, to get us back to the book of Jonah. But I'll do anything for you. It gives us the context of our own experience in this country provides the backdrop to why Jonah felt the way he felt. It gives us a sense of the angst that led Jonah, led to Jonah's obstinance and anger that led to his disobedience to the command of God to do something that he was mentally, physically, and spiritually capable of doing, but he was mentally, physically, and spiritually unwilling to do it. He could not see past his personal and nationalistic fervor the hurts and the insults at the hands of the Ninevites in order to preach repentance and salvation and redemption. Yes, Jonah was an Afro-Asiatic brother whose people had been beaten down, ridiculed, treated like things to be used and not people to be loved. And then God calls on him to do the unthinkable. God calls on him 
to do the one thing that black folk today must also grapple with, and that is to bless those we think ought to be cursed. And I know somebody saying, but blood saw we just talked about Jonah running from God and getting swallowed by the big fish the last couple of weeks. We even talked about Jonah being thankful for the grace and mercy of God that he's shown to him in Israel. But he was unwilling to consider that same grace and mercy being extended to the likes of Nineveh and the rest of Assyria. He built a fence around God. Who God could bless, when God could bless, how God could bless. You see, there are just some things Jonah was not willing to do, but since we're so much like him, I need to burst that bubble because in the final analysis, what Jonah was not willing to do had no bearing on what God was bringing to bear for Nineveh and for Jonah. And as I was last week, second sermon on Jonah, and I, and in my mind, my heart, I was done. But the Holy Spirit pressed on my heart and on my mind that there's one more message for my children, and I need to pour it through you. You see, the more I read and meditated on Jonah, the more I was unsettled by Jonah's story. See, there's nothing new in Jonah's story. It's the same story it has always been. The book of Jonah is a mere four chapters long, but when it ends, there's no resolution. Huh. See, in modernism and modern Christianity, we like stories that have a nice, neat bow that ties it all together. And then we all get together around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. And then everybody lives happily ever after. Hmm. We like stories that end with happiness. We like stories like the Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace and, the, and it was turned up seven times hotter and the very men who threw them in burned up themselves. But God got in the fire with these brothers and, and brought them out and they didn't even smell like smoke. We like that story. We like stories like, like the lions who've been starved and taunted and picked at and aggravated and Daniel was thrown into their den to be their dinner but, but God shut the mouths of the lions and not a hair on Daniel's head was touched and when the king ran to check on him, Daniel testified, Oh king, I'm still here. We, we like that story, Reverend Jordan. We, we like that story. We, uh, yeah, I guess y'all didn't like Daniel. I like Daniel. See, just Jesus was dragged one Thursday night from kangaroo court to kangaroo court. He was beaten all night long, ridiculed and spat upon. He was slapped. He was stripped of his own clothes. A crown of thorns was pressed on his head. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. And at the ninth hour Friday afternoon, he gave up the ghost. He died. But the story doesn't end there. The story says he stayed dead all day Saturday. He stayed dead all night Saturday. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in the palm of his hands. We like that story. We like that it ends with victory. It ends with surety. It ends with certainty.
But we get unsettled by things that don't come to a happy ending. We don't even watch TV shows that don't end happily. And that's the problem for me with Jonah's story. See, chapter 4 doesn't end neatly and nicely. It just kind of hangs there. It doesn't tell us that Jonah learned a lesson. Doesn't tell us that Jonah stopped being mad at God. It doesn't tell us that Jonah finally acknowledged that the grace of God and the mercy of God did not solely belong to him and Israel. It doesn't even tell us that Jonah finally understood what God was trying to show him and tell him. Instead, when the book ends, Jonah was stuck in a dilemma and nearly 3,000 years later, his situation remains unresolved. Can I give you three Baptist points and we can go home? Can I do this? Watch this. About how this book does not end, it's still being written. Watch this. The first thought I need you to consider about the end of Jonah, the book of Jonah, is that it was never about Nineveh. It was never about Nineveh. How many problems in your life, in your marriage, would be less than or non-existence if you really understood what the argument or the disagreement was really about. It was never about Nineveh. Yes, Nineveh played a prominent role in this drama, but it was written by God Produced by God, directed by God, and it starred God. But the production itself was never about Nineveh. Watch this. I'm going to help you out right here because if God had only wanted to save Nineveh, the book of Jonah would have ended in chapter 3. Huh? Verse 10 says, in chapter 3, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. God relented from the disaster that God said God would bring upon them. And then it says, he did not do it. Nineveh repented. Nineveh was saved, but Jonah was unhinged. Jonah was still trying to do things his way. He was still trying to bend what God could do his way. Jonah still thought he had some say so. Jonah had been taught uh, that reconstruction was a fair. He didn't, it wasn't reconstruction then. It was, that was just me, I'm sorry. Jonah had been taught that Israel was God's favorite people and everybody else had to stand back and watch God bless Israel. And nobody else. Jonah thought that he had God down pat. He thought he understood everything that needed to be understood about God. And that if he simply maintained his still will. Then God would come around. He believed that Nineveh would eventually slip up. And when they slip, God would be there to crush them. But can I tell you, it doesn't matter how, what kind of will you got. Willpower won't power supreme power. Nineveh re re repented and Nineveh was saved by the end of chapter 3. But we have a chapter 4. We have a chapter 4 because apparently the story didn't end with Nineveh. God was still at work. After Nineveh 
repented. After Nineveh was saved, God was still working. Why? Because God's servant was still obstinate. He was still stubborn. He was still adamant that things were going to work out his way, that he was right, and God had obviously missed something. God had made a mistake, and here it is. Jonah's greatest problem, his biggest problem, was that he never completely submitted to God. He never fully yielded to God. He had an issue with nationalistic superiority. See, Jonah was not just a Jew, he was a good Jew. He was a prophet chosen by God. Jonah knew God's truth. Jonah obeyed God's orders, but he relented to do God's will from his heart. I gotta, I'm going to back up. I'm going to back up. One more time. Deacon Simmons, can I do this one? One more time, because I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. Jonah convinced himself to do God's, or to follow God's orders, to obey God's orders, but he never relented to do God's will from his heart. See, just like so many of us, Jonah obeyed God's order not because he understood God, not because he decided to let God be God and do what only God can do, but Jonah obeyed God's order because he was afraid God might send another big fish. <laughs> he was scared. Didn't go to the beach no more. He didn't didn't want no more big fishes. Jonah only obeyed God's order because he was afraid of what God might do the next time. And he never put his heart in what he was doing. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, my brothers and sisters, that we serve God as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Yes, Nineveh was evil. Yes, Nineveh was Israel's fiercest enemy. Yes, Nineveh was cruel to Israel. Yes, Nineveh was undeserving of God's blessings but God blesses whom God will and I wish there was somebody here today not afraid to confess that Jonah is you and you are Jonah you too strayed and you too have gone left when God told you to go right you too have served God half heartedly rather than giving God everything you've got but but God still wants to save you. God still loves you in spite of you. God still moves mountains for you. God still leaves the 99 and searches for you. God will still light a candle, sweep the floor, and then look everywhere just for you. God will, my brothers and sisters, give you your inheritance, let you storm out the door then God will sit on the front porch and wait for you to come home and when you come home he won't wait he'll run out to you he'll throw his arms around you he'll kiss you on the neck he'll put a ring on your finger he'll kill the fatted cat he'll put a robe on your back because God loves you just that much It was never about Nineveh. Second thought I want to give you right there. We're almost there. Is that Jonah underestimated God's undying compassion for all of God's creation. Jonah underestimated God's compassion for all. Of God's creation. Even if you don't believe what I believe. 
God still created you. Even if you don't worship the way I worship, God still created. Even if you ain't never been to church a day in, your, you never graduated from Sunday school, you ain't had perfect attention, you, you don't even know what BTU is, you're still a creation of God. So watch God push back on Jonah's understanding. God says to Jonah, should I not spare Nineveh? Watch what he calls that great city. These are unbelievers. They're merciless. God calls them that great city. Not like what we do when we tell that story in the Gospel of Luke about the, the good Samaritan. Don't ever say that. That ain't in the Bible. They put it in there, but it ain't, it, ain't of, it ain't of God. The good Samaritan suggests that he was the only one. And the rest of them were not. Kind of like black folk. I'm going to go on with that, though. I'm going to go. I'm going. God says, should I not spare Nineveh? And I always like to think, God says, should I not spare Nineveh like when you were in the belly of the fish? I spared you. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city? Because what God is trying to get him to see, number one, that God is not small enough for you to put in your pocket. He, God is showing a boundaryless compassion and love and overflowing compassion and overflowing generosity and overflowing mercy and it's driving Jonah crazy. But watch how God multiplies compassion beyond Jonah's ability to comprehend it. God blessed Jonah with the gift to preach. Not just the gift to preach, but the gift to preach to Nineveh. And watch this. He preached to Nineveh and the Bible says 120,000 heard him and repented. That just... Huh. For context, the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon and 3,000 joined. And we are here today as the church because that represented the birth of the church out of 3,000. But God touched Jonah's heart and his mind, put fire on his tongue to preach a word to 120,000 and everybody walked down the aisle. But Jonah was mad. Jonah didn't even think it was a good sermon. All because his heart wasn't in it. All because he did what God told him to do, but he did it half-stepping. He did what God told him to do, but he did it his way. And just like folk in the church, God knows my heart. You are absolutely right. God does know your heart. God knows you got a job to keep you busy. God gave it to you. But does that job mean more to you than God does? Watch this, watch this, watch this. God gave you that husband or that wife that you can't get along with because you're, un you're disagreeable. Bottom line. But guess what? If God gave them to you, you ought to find the good. You ought to talk to God. You ought to find out, God, you put me right here for a reason. And right now, I'm not talking about somebody abusing you. I'm talking about you just being disagreeable. Jonah. 
be like on the playground. <laughs> Jonah didn't put his heart in it. But watch this. Jonah preached what God told him to preach. But he didn't do it with the right spirit. The brother probably didn't even take the taste. But there was something about the words God told him to preach. There's something about what God sent him to do that was bigger than him. I'm going to say that again because y'all, right? But there's something that God has placed in you to do that you don't want to do it. You keep running from it, but it's bigger than you. And whatever God puts in you or on you is coming out even if it has to come over you. Why they say, what got into you? God got into me. There's something strong and soul stirring about what God had told him to say. Jonah didn't even want to preach. See, it wasn't just what the Ninevites had done. Y'all got to to see it from, from Jonah's perspective too. It was not just what they did. It was who they were. It was the way they talked to Israel and talked about Israel. It was the entitlement that oozed out of their false confidence. They were Assyrians and the Jews would simply never measure up. So Jonah preached because God told him to. But Jonah wasn't moved. Jonah preached. He wasn't moved, but God was moving. God was moved because it wasn't just 120,000. It was the individuals who made up the 120,000. You see, God, what we see as a forest, God sees the trees. What we see is a crowd. God sees what we see, but God can see every one of us all at the same time. There were men in that 120,000. There were women in that 120,000. And I believe God, being God over all, God also saw God saw them in the midst of that 120,000. I believe God saw some children and God's compassion for children was magnified in that moment. And when, when do you get that blood saw in the text? Watch this. God says those who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And I'm just crazy enough to believe that just like God would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah, if there had been 10 righteous people in it I'm here to tell you today that one child lost one child destroyed was one child too many suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God I'm just crazy enough loopy enough in love with God to believe that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked might turn from their way and be saved. That's why God told Nineveh, told Jonah to preach to Nineveh. That's why God told Jonah to speak the words of life. That's why God told him, don't say what you want to say. Say what I tell you. It was God just being God and God being the author and the finisher of our fate. It was God being the Alpha and the Omega. It was God being the beginning and the end while we're trying to figure it out God has already worked it out do I have a witness in here today that God's compassion exceeds our mere imaginations finally I'd like you to consider about the ending of this book of Jonah 
This one last thought, and I'll leave you alone. A lack of forgiveness will block you from receiving the favor of God. Black folks struggling. Black folk mad. Talking about Mr. Charlie. Eh, Mr. Charlie ain't like you. the same Mr. Charlie. Inside. A lack of forgiveness will block you from receiving the favor of God. The joy of the Lord. And I hear you. I hear you, Ebenezer. This civil rights bastion. Ebenezer West. Great outspoken leader, 40 years. Dr. Winfrey Holt just, just passed us down through the years. Who stood capably and ably right here. I, I, I get it. I hear you. I, I hear what you've been through. 250 years of chattel slavery. It's a long time. 150 years of Jim and Jane Crow sharecropping. Forgiveness? Convict le leasing. Forgiveness? Redlining and lynchings. Forgive. Voter suppression. Stop and frisk. Driving while black, ain't doing nothing. Forgive. Last hire, first fire. After 400 years, of American exceptionalism and second class citizenship is hard to forgive. Jonah couldn't forgive. In fact, I'll step out on the limb and say Jonah wouldn't forgive. Jonah was caught up in the evil nature of the Ninevites and he simply couldn't get past not just what they had done, but what they were still doing. Huh. Jonah didn't have that spirit of father forgive them for they know not what they do. Jonah knew they were emasculating Israel. Cementing Jews as a permanent underclass while robbing Israel of precious resources all so they could make Nineveh great again. Jonah could not forgive. Jonah would not let himself forgive. He was caught up with the evil nature of the Ninevites and he simply couldn't get past not just what they had done, but what they were still doing to them in the moment, my brothers and sisters. And I ought to be able to get at least one amen in this house today who will co-sign that forgiving is hard to do. Forgiving those who have in, uh, who've offended us, those who have injured us mentally, physically, those who have imprisoned and enslaved us, forgiving those who oppress us is one of the hardest things to try to get our hearts and our minds around. Yes, I know what Jesus said seven times 70 in a day, but it's hard to forgive. forgive not only watch this not only does the book of Jonah end on a cliffhanger the book also ends with a question the book of Jonah ends by putting the ball in your hand The book of Jonah ends by putting the ball in your hands, the ball of forgiveness. How 
will you handle? The boy, that's what the young people say. You ain't got no handle. Do you have a handle? The Paul is in your hands because the story here in the Bible is about a man named Jonah, but it's also your story. Remember the old show, uh, the story you're about to hear is true, but the names have been changed to protect the innocent. But can, <laughs> can I tell you before I head out, I believe that the question mark, yes, is there physically in the scriptures, but is it in your heart? Because there are too many people who see themselves not as a part of this story. You fail, we fail to see ourselves in Jonah's story. Too many people still see Jonah's story as his story and not our own. And we keep missing the point that God still wants you to turn back to him. God has something in your life. God has plans for your life. And you keep going to Tarshish and rather than going to Nineveh, God still wants you to turn back. Turn away from the evil ways and evil thoughts. God wants to forgive you. God wants you to forgive. And not just to forgive. You also got to forget. That's where I blew it. Most of y'all with me right up in that one. Just. God doesn't just want you to forgive. God wants you to forget. And I hear you saying, blood, so I, it's hard to forgive, but I can, I can get, I can get up to the door. I can, I can knock on the door, but, 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 but I can't go in. I can't forget. The devil is a liar. I want you to know you can forget. Can I prove it to you? You do it all the time. You forgot that when you laid up last night, laid down, there was no guarantee you were going to be able to get up, but you got up anyhow and never told God thank you. You forgot. You forgot how God found you beaten, battered, and bruised, you forgot how God found you and took that needle out of your arm. You, how God found you and took that bottle out of your hand. You forgot how God took gambling out of your heart. You took, uh, he took cussing out of your mouth. He took thoughts of death out of your mind. You, you've forgotten that every time God blesses you, it's because God forgot how evil you really are, how wicked you are, how, how forgetful and unthankful you are. Now, when it's time to tell God thank you we forget so yes you can forget and forgive final thought I'll drop this in somebody's spirit especially those who are mad right now but that's alright forgiveness has nothing to do with the offending party I'm going to back up and do that one again. I'm gonna, might have been a typo. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the offending party. You can't control what they do, what they say, but you can control you and what you do and what you say. It does not matter what the offense was Forgiveness is what you do to set yourself free. See? See? Jonah is still in the proverbial belly of the whale because Jonah, as the book ends, still has not learned to forgive. I'm here to tell somebody today, if you want to stay out and get out of the belly of the whale, you've got to learn how to forgive. 
Watch this. Forgiving, forgiveness, or refusing to forgive, is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That don't make no sense. That's what my grandma would say, right? That don't make no sense. It's like you drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. I wish I had a witness in here today, but don't clap. Don't, I, 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 a lack of forgiveness locks you up in a room with open doors. When all you've got to do is remember Romans 12, when it says, when the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And a whole bunch of church folk quote that scripture and a whole lot of other scripture, just like Nona, a whole bunch of church folk go through the motions in our service to God, just like Jonah. A whole bunch of us think we know better in different situations than God, just like Jonah. We know no God will handle it. We know God can handle it. But a bunch of us, we want to stand off to the side. And when God puts them in the headlock, God puts them in the handcuffs, we want to punch them in the face just so we can let them go then. We want to help out. But can I tell you something? God did not send for you because God doesn't need your help. You are raggedy enough. You don't need to be worrying about what other folk need. You just need to worry about yourself. God didn't need you to fix it back then and he doesn't need you to fix it right now. Let God be God and do God's job. Let go and let God. I know that story does not end like we want it to end. I know my brothers and sisters that if we had our own pen we We'd want Jonah to ride off into the sunset. But can I tell you some good news? Good news that you can use. God left the back door of the text open. That's why God didn't close the story out. God put the key under the flower pot beside the third step on the back porch just so when you get lost, you can still get in the house. I hope there's somebody here who knows that Jonah's story is your story Jonah's story is my story Jonah's story is black folk party Jonah's story is America's story can I get a witness today because this story is not about Nineveh this story is not about Jonah this story is about a forgiving God who in spite of us saves us who in spite of us delivers us who in spite of us redeems us who in spite of us saves us who in spite of us restores us and revives us is there a witness here today who knows that I know I'm broke down I'm broke up from the floor up but God can still use me I need you to know today doesn't matter where you've been and what you did God can still use I need you to know today that God can still hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. Is there a witness here today who's not afraid to admit I don't know how to forgive, but I'm going to keep my hand in God's hand and he will show me the way. He will give me the strength. He will give me just what I need just when I need it is there a witness who's ready to testify that God is my friend that God is my battle axe that God is my stronghold that God is my horn of oil God is my fortress he will save me he will fight my battles he will show up when the enemy plants his flag I know I know 
know, I know the world won't have the last word because my God is still writing my story. There's a question mark in my life and I know the answer. His name is Jesus. His name is Savior. His name is the root of Jesse. His name is the son of David. His name is a rose of Sharon. His name is a bright and morning star. His name is sweet I know. His name Shout yeah, shout yeah, shout yeah. When we learn to forgive, and to forget we'll know that God can bless anybody anywhere anytime and watch this I'll be satisfied through Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior amen amen and amen won't you stand to your feet the doors of the church are open. Jonah had a dilemma. Jonah had decisions to make. Just like you. In this moment, your name is Jonah. But it doesn't mean that you have to spend an eternity with questions over your life. You can make up in your mind right now to turn your life over to him. You can make up in your mind That yes, I've got a dilemma, but I know the solution. His name is Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a personal relationship? I know your grandmama knew him. Your deacon daddy or your deacon mama knows him but this is a personal situation do you know him mama may have papa may have but God bless the child whose God is on are you here today and this is your moment I love the fact that, that out of all of the billions of people on the face of the earth, God knows you. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. And all you got to do is say one three-letter word. Yes. He's, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. stand at the door and knock will you open the door the door of your heart and he has given you a promise that if you open the door he'll come in he'll come in won't you come won't you come won't you come um Maybe, maybe you have committed your life to Christ, but you're, you're just like Jonah. You 
know that it's hard, but you also know that God will keep you. You need prayer, it's, it's praying time. The road gets long sometimes. Trouble shows up. You need prayer. If you, anybody in here, if, if, does prayer change things? You ought to put your hand up. If, if, if prayer, cha- if you've ever seen the power of prayer in your life, let me see your hand. If you, if you believe that prayer doesn't just change things, but prayer will change me. Put your hand up. That's just, you ought to, the floor is open look at young brother young brother William coming on down the Bible says and a child shall lead them the altar is open won't you come won't you come survival here was against the odds, but we're here. Our predecessors were enslaved and toiled plantations in the hot sun under immense stress, brutality, and inhumane conditions, but we're still here. Our parents and our grandparents marched against injustices and raised their voices to demand equality, and they were beaten and jailed and killed, but look at us. We're still here. Today, forces remain and racism persists. And it's not as obvious as it used to be, but it's there. Systems and structures are not in our favor, Lord, but you've enabled us to experience some successes and to see many of our brothers and sisters rise to the highest offices in the government and business. And we say thank you. Despite those successes, Lord, we still have challenges as a people and individually. And we present them to you this morning, Lord, because we are standing in the need of prayer. We are standing here in our pain, and we are asking for healing. Help us, Lord. We are standing with our grief and asking for comfort, Lord. Help us, Lord. We are standing in our loneliness, and we're asking you to be our company company keeper. We are standing in our depression and asking for relief, but we know that you are mind fixer and a heart regulator. Help us, Lord. We are standing with financial needs, Lord, but we know that you are a provider, and you have always made a way out of nowhere. Lord, our country is in turmoil, and confusion surrounds us. And we don't know the answers, Lord. We need your help. And we know that whatever we need, Lord, you've got it. Help us, Lord. Help us in our pain. Help us in our grief. Help us in our despair. Help us in our confusion. In every state that we are in, Lord, we ask that you help us. And we still say thank you. 
we praise you because you have been with us a long time and you promised to never leave us. So on this first Sunday in Black History Month, Lord, we can say, if no one else can say, that you are a promise keeper because despite every challenge and every mountain we've come through still standing, you've been a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, and we praise you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. Because of you, we stand here today. Lord, we are black. We are proud. We are strong. We are overcomers. And we are still here. And we say hallelujah. 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 And amen. for a few minutes to my left and to your right. I am grateful, my brothers and sisters, that we serve a God who sits high and he looks low. It doesn't matter how low we fall. He can always reach us. All of our lives, meet at the end of the book of Jonah living the dilemma yet God has given us the option the alternative that Jonah never had and that was to choose Jesus that's how you close the book of Jonah Choose Jesus. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, we thank you. God, we just thank you for all that our eyes have seen, all our ears have heard, all our hearts have felt. We pray right now, oh God, if there has been anything unbecoming that has been spoken of you that is not according to your way, your word, or your will, we ask, oh God, that you would remove it, strike it from our memory banks to never be uttered again. We ask, oh God, that you would give us a spirit of forgiveness that will fling open the doors and the gates to your favor. Help us, oh God, to navigate each day of the week that we're going into now, understanding that your grace and your mercy does not stop at our doorstep, but it flows freely to all of your creation. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his glorious presence with great joy. To the only God, our Lord and our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. May it rest, rule, and abide within each and every one of us now, henceforth, and forevermore. And all of God's children said amen, amen, and amen. Want to turn to your neighbor? Tell your neighbor. Learn to forgive. It's the key to God's favor in your life. God loves you. My pastor loves you. I love you. And there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. Go in peace.